now we have a few minutes uh, to try to thread this all together because there are a lot of interesting ideas. And frankly, I think it, it starts there, right? I mean, you have, you have an interesting idea, you come forward, you give a presentation, but how do you pick? How do you pick what you're going to do? How do you pick whether we're going to do hospital home, the housing thing, you know, the guardrails, the, even what you were talking about with, with eye care? I mean, these are all really good ideas. There's a lot of excitement about this. But how do you pick? And who gets to pick? And, and whoever wants to grab that, uh, uh, go for it. Well, I, I strongly believe that we all should do what we can right now. There's a tendency, especially when we're talking about social determinants, and when we say, well, health is impacted by so many things. It's healthcare, it's, it's what happens in the homes, it's housing, it's employment. I mean, sometimes there's a tendency for all of us to just freeze and say, well, I don't know what I'm gonna do, right? How do I even get started? But if there's a patient in front of me in the ER who is unresponsive, has many other ill, has many other problems that are happening, it's never my option to say it's someone else's problem to deal with. I have to do what I can right now. And that's been our principle in Baltimore of saying, what are things that we can impact right now? We understand that there are many other factors. I mean, we know that getting glasses for kids isn't the answer to improving education. But if that's what we can do from our vantage point, that's what we need to do now. And I'll add one more thing as well. When you ask the question of who gets to pick, mm -hmm. we haven't talked about this as much today, but I want to make sure that we bring in patients, families, and communities more broadly into this conversation as the who gets to choose. Um, um, back in 2015, after the unrest that followed the, the death of, of Freddie Gray, an unarmed African-American man while in police custody, I remember that my team, we went door to door because there were multiple pharmacies that were burned down or closed and people needed pharmacies to get medications and food and un other supplies. So we went door to door to tell people about a prescription service that we had, a 24 seven prescription delivery, food delivery service that we had. Over and over again, we heard questions that were posed to us of what candidate are you campaigning for? <laughs> or what study is this? We filled out a survey last week. Hmm. I mean, our residents always see us there for our needs and not for theirs. And they were conveying that they no longer want to be this checkbox of, yes, we consulted you, but rather, how can we engage community members in a real way as full partners for figuring out what are the priorities that we should dedicate ourselves to. And that might mean in public health in particular, or healthcare, for us to not just be focusing on these really long-term goals of improving life expectancy or reducing disparities that are longer term, but maybe something concrete like starting programs to deliver food to people who are living in food deserts or um, other very concrete steps that we can show that we're taking action now. So for David and Cyrus, and I know you were just gonna add something there, but, but to this point that Lena noted, your programs have partners with deep pockets, for example. You have partners with banks or health insurance companies. My sense is that they're gonna have their own estimation of how to spend their own money that may conflict with some of the things we're talking about. Yeah, so I, you know, your question I think is really a provocative one, like how do you pick? And I just think that's, the totally wrong mindset. Like it's a scarcity mindset that we have just enough money, what are, which, which, which can we afford, what we can't afford. What we have is a scarcity of imagination. That's the problem. We spend enough money. There is plenty of money. This is not, some, I'm not talking about raising taxes. I'm not talking about anything of that sort. It's about spending the money we already spend in a better way. So if I were really gonna be, I have fantasized about quitting my job and going to some venture capitalist and getting a billion dollars. And what I would do is go into a community and I would somehow buy the catastrophic health risk for that whole community. And then I would manage the hell out of it. I would go upstream in every conceivable way and I'd make sure every school had an optometrist and that the My Connections approach was incorporated into all the homeless programs and that chronic disease patients were being kept at home and I would build an upstream intervention dream team from the people who are on this stage in addition to the bus drivers and scouts 
leaders and the others that sort of make sure you could sort of encourage this sort of the healthy development to sort of try to avoid the shame and despair that leads to opioid addiction or the or risk taking behavior in adolescence and all these other in all these other ways. So I, I just am I am fundamentally convinced that we can do a better job um, of taking care of each other. Cyrus. So uh, just one point of correction um, to what you had said. So um, we're not partnering with people with deep pockets. I work for the company that has the deep pocket, right? right? Um, we're, we're Fortune 5. And um, I bring that point up because I really do feel like our um, organization as a top corporation in the United States is perfectly positioned to start this, this social movement um, that, I, that I was talking about. Um, and so I can start at a very high level of, yep, we insure um, 7 million Medicaid you know, patients. But to myself and my teams and, and our leadership and how we've gotten um, the investment we have into our project work, it's about the power of one, right? One patient at a time. And it's not about fixing people. That's where the medical system has tripped over its own heels. It's about walking alongside. So in the way that I told the story of our program, um, I brought my own story into that because we all have our own stories. So it's about walking alongside and recognizing that, that our society has um, influenced this individual and that we as human beings have the ability to influence that individual as well. So through aspects <laughs> of care and love, we can start and we can be part of that journey with that individual. Um, and move away from a mentality of fixing and, and move towards a mentality of appreciating, recognizing, and acknowledging what this individual has gone through. Acknowledging the traumas and, and the challenge um, that, that, these, um, that these individuals have gone through. And in many cases, they're not different from our own stories um, in a lot of ways, but things have happened. Um, that have put them into the circumstances in which they find themselves. So um, for me, um, it's very much about the power of one. So David, how in, when you were developing your hospital home program, did you navigate or jump over, in my experience, in my professional life, which has nothing to do with medicine, I come from a place where it only takes one naysayer usually in the legal department, <laughs> to completely destroy any <laughs> cool idea that's out there. <laughs> um, and I, I would sense that the idea of sending doctors into people's homes, um, you know, questions of whether that has enough staff back at the hospital. I, I'm just thinking your legal department's brain is blowing up when you come to them with Multiple developing. brain blow-ups, yes. There's a lot of brain blow-ups. Yeah. So how do you navigate that? There's a lot of brain blow-ups yeah. on this stage. Yeah. And I, I just, how do you navigate that? Yeah, so I think it's all about coming with data. Yeah. Um, that, that is really my, I mean, I'm a researcher. That is yeah. kind of my principal tool. Um, and then coming with stories uh, of, of what happens to patients when you treat them this way. Um, you know, we're fortunate. There, other people have done a, lo a lot of the stuff that we're all talking about around the world. Like nothing, to, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think that anything that's been talked about on this stage has, is the first of its kind in the world. Um, you can probably go to many parts of, the, of Europe and things like that and see these kinds of things happening, right? There are much larger social infrastructure, public works systems elsewhere in the world. Um, and so I think a lot of times leaning on the shoulders of others is very helpful, right? Saying, you know, people have been doing home hospital in Victoria, Australia for two decades and no one has had a, a, a rather awful outcome. Yeah. What do you think about that risk management? Um, and so that's helpful. Um, and then the other part is just saying, well, what we do doesn't work, guys. Like, this person has been to the ED every single day this month, and then they've been admitted 16 times this year. Give us a chance to go see what's going on in their home and to help them with their both acute medical needs but also their social determinants. Um, and that's a, that's a powerful, powerful but, way of looking at it. But Cyrus made the case for why his company saves money yeah. by doing that. Your company doesn't save money in terms of billing. 
So you, you spoke to that in your, in your talk, so that it seems like the business department and the legal department could both be blowing up their brains in your case. Yeah, so so it is, it's a different model. Um, it's very, very easy to look at how we are a very cost-saving operation. Um, so first of all, there's not enough beds at Brigham. So if we take somebody who has a primary or secondary care issue, like good old pneumonia, and bring them home, that's making room for the person who's on their fourth liver transplant. And so it's getting the right care to the right patient at the right time. Brigham is a quaternary care institution, just like Mayo here. And my, in my view, there is no reason that somebody with community-acquired pneumonia should be in a place like this. Um, they should be at home. They should be getting their care there. And it's, it's getting the resources to the right place. Um, to, your, to your question of like, how do we pick all these great things, I, 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 again, I look to what, what do other people do? I'm also a health services researcher, and we look at Britain. How do they pick what they do? They put, they put cost models on everything, and they say, this is a cost-effective intervention. This is not, so we're going to pay for this. Um, we don't do that in America um, at all. So we're also taking questions from you, and we have a lot of questions, so thank you very much for using the Poll EV uh, website, and we're, we're hearing a lot of your questions. And it occurs to me, uh, Dr. Wen, that you're of the people on stage about to change, you're the one who's going to change your business card the, the, the soonest uh, <laughs> with your new job that, that is coming um, with Planned Parenthood. And I'm just thinking, I hear about what you talked about in Baltimore, for example, just using the, the glasses example, the low-hanging fruit. What do you foresee, or do you at this moment foresee any low-hanging fruit like the glasses example that you will try to bring to Planned Parenthood? Mm. Um, you know, when I, I've been thinking a lot about the challenges that are ahead in Planned Parenthood, and, and I've been asked this question a lot, just about what are you going to change, and thinking about the challenges, the challenges that I see in Planned Parenthood are not what's happening that Planned Parenthood is doing. The challenges are the attacks on Planned Parenthood that to me, from a medical scientific standpoint, just don't make sense. Think about the gag rule for, for a second. How outrageous would it be if we had the government start telling people, telling doctors about what they can and cannot say to patients with diabetes mm -hmm. about insulin? I mean, how outraged would we all be to say, well, patients with insulin now, or with diabetes now, can't get information about insulin. And by the way, it's not all patients. It's if you are wealthy, if you can afford healthcare, you will still be able to get all the insulin that you need and all the healthcare that you need. But if you're poor, you will not be able to get access to healthcare. I mean, that's what's happening. Um, I've been asked a lot of questions also about, well, isn't this a political job or isn't this a political organization? But you know what, I mean, healthcare shouldn't be political. We shouldn't be politicizing women's health, access to what I believe strongly is the fundamental right to healthcare. Those are the things that we're fighting against every day. And so to me, it's not so much about what's happening within Planned Parenthood that I would want to change, but rather what is the narrative that we're seeing? And the narrative is this continued stigmatization, siloing out, singling out of one type of healthcare. And women's healthcare is healthcare. Reproductive healthcare is healthcare. And healthcare for all of us just has to be valued as a fundamental human right. Could you um, foresee, just to blend well, some of the talks here, so for example, here's, here's just a, here's a crazy idea. What if Planned Parenthood, in addition to the clinics you run and all the health services you provide, got into the housing game? Like what Cyrus is talking about. What if Planned Parenthood built its own affordable housing? I mean, is that, is that worth discussing? I don't know, is that an idea? I think that um, you know, Planned Parenthood was started over 100 years ago by a nurse, by Margaret Sanger, who saw the needs in her community. And the need at that time that she saw was birth control, information about birth control for married women, which was illegal. And she started providing that information, went to jail for it, started delivering care in jails, because that's where, where, where the need was too. I mean, I think Planned Parenthood, just like the work that we do in our respective healthcare institutions or other organizations, we're all about providing care to people where they are. It's about meeting the needs of individuals and the people, the women and men who walk through the doors of Planned Parenthood may not just have one need. 
they're not only there for their reproductive health need or some other need, they also may have other needs as well. And we do provide these services. We do connect people to other resources like housing and social services, and we'll continue to do that even in the face of attacks on our services and attacks on our mission. We will never let go of our core principle, which is caring for people no matter what. David Erickson, a question here from, from, from our, our great audience here. We've talked a lot about different minority statuses. We've not discussed LG, LGBT plus folks. How might we tackle the drastic disparities in these communities? One example being um, the percentage of, of attempted suicide rates in mm. trans men, for example. Um, whether it's in the healthcare operations or more broadly in the social determinants you were talking about. No, it's an excellent question. I, I want to go back to your earlier question, which I think, uh, and I, I will get to the, the LGBTQ question, but um, about Planned Parenthood building housing, which I think is a terrible idea, right? And uh, and I think, uh, and United Healthcare doesn't build housing either, right? United Healthcare partners with uh, right. Chicanos por la Causa, uh, CDC uh -huh. in uh, Arizona to build to, to do rehab housing because there's a specialty there. So for those of you who are kind of hospital based, like you don't build your own ambulances and you don't build your own computers, right? You there are people who do that very well, and for those who are interested in improving the upstream social determinants of health, there are, uh, there is a, there are const there's a constellation of partners that you can partner with that are better at almost every aspect of that um, management than you are. So it's a question of coordination. So I just, just I, I, I thought it was helpful, that question was helpful. Uh, in terms of L LGBTQ questions, uh, and, and uh, my husband is in the audience, so I, and this is something I do think of quite a bit about. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think w w what I would like to see is some kind of a predictive model that identifies precursors. And, and, and ultimately, these are issues around things like shame and despair, which drive people to do something so crazy, like to put a needle in their arm and have a one in 10 chance of waking up again or to commit suicide as an LGBT kid who thinks that they don't fit into this world, there are ways that you can identify that earlier. And I've been, I've been really amazed at conversations I've had with Jenny Ismert from United Health, where she says, yeah, we know who's gonna be in the emergency room six months before it happens. And we know who's gonna be homeless a year before it happens. And I think we can identify kids who are struggling with issues like not fitting in, not like feeling like they are alone and in, 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 in tackling an issue like being gay and not in, in, in a world that's not ready for that, um, and provide them the guardrails and the airbags that help them get through that. And I just want to add, add on um, and go back to this, this question about housing. And you're absolutely right, David. I completely agree with you, right? So the concept of a team of teams is um, is imperative to the success of what we as a healthcare community um, seek to achieve. If we think about a, you know, for example, um, a machine that, that monitors blood glucose, it would be foolish for us to try to go in and reinvent that. It's much better for us to partner with an agency that's already had that invented. We would spend 10 years trying to invent a machine that's already there. So a big part of what we are currently doing is bringing to the table partners who get this stuff. They get housing, they get MAT, medication assisted treatment, Suboxone, they get trauma informed care and connecting the dots in a fundamentally fragmented and disjointed system. Um, thus the name My Connections. So I, I just wanted to touch yeah. on that. Well, but adding to that, and to what David said earlier about partnering with other organizations, let me just ask the provocative question. You noted the stat about the top 500 costliest homeless uh, patients. You were spending 81 million a year on their hospitalization costs. So my back of the envelope says, let's just say, instead of partnering with whoever builds the house, that United Healthcare just writes the check. That it's just say $1,200 a month for rent or a mortgage. You do that for the 500 people, that's 7.2 million a year versus the 81 that you spent. So why not just write the check? We are. That's exactly what we're doing. Okay. So, so we are literally, and, and that um, is the bottom line of the business case that, that we've created. It makes so much more sense to subsidize an individual's rent and get them off the streets. Housing first, right? So the first thing we need to do is not worry about 
getting them off drugs, but rather get them into safe and stable housing. And then from there we can start to build. Um, so absolutely, um, that's, that's fundamental to our approach. Dr. Levy, were you going to add something? I just, I just want to add one thing that's, that you know, we run into a lot in the healthcare side of things in this partnership business, because it's not as straightforward for us as just finding partners. Because a lot of times the problem mm. is that the partners don't do it well. Mm. So take, for example, um, you, know, you could say that the entire acute care system, it doesn't do acute care well, because look at the outcomes. Folks are coming back a quarter of the time, right? You could say visiting nurses don't do it well because their, their patients are coming back. Um, you could say the primary care doctors don't do it well, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and a lot of times there are people out there that do claim to have expertise in an area, but the way that they've either been shoved into doing what they do um, is just so inefficient and in the spirit of transform, like you need to go beyond them. Um, yeah. and, and sometimes the existing partner is not actually, you can't connect those dots, you have to create. Is there a reason, and this is a question from the audience, that home, hospital home, it won't ever fully take off? Is there a, a norm that we have today and a barrier that we can't yet no. knock down that will prevent no. that from ever happening? No, I, I, think, I think, as in that last slide that I put up there, I think there are some payment issues that are currently very much getting um, worked out. The Physicians Advisory Committee, the PTAC, um, it, to CMS has essentially unanimously approved home hospitalization, the care model, and a payment model for it recently. Um, and uh, there are several, several examples of major payers in the country paying for home hospitalization now, commercial payers, um, and, uh, which is all incredibly exciting stuff. So I think in the next five years, you will see a, a payment structure for it, and I also think you'll see a major change in norms, right? We have taught America that the place to go when you're sick is a hospital. Um, and if we reteach America that the place to go when you're sick is to stay in your home and to get the care that you need in the right way, um, that, that's a norms discussion. That's a huge lift. It, it is, it I is. I can see people but, coming But you should hospital. see these people when they're in their home. But, you should it, see people, but, but don't you also see people in the ER who come in and say, I'm sick, help me. Yeah. And you say, well, do you want to go right back home? Yeah, yeah. And, right. and, and, so, and there's, a really interesting, there's a really interesting response from patients. Half of the patients give you hip hip hooray, get me the hell out of here. <laughs> the other half of the patients say, oh no, I, am too, I can't go back home, this is crazy, what do you mean? Um, yeah. And then you work with them and, and you don't get them all. Some people end up um, staying in the hospital and declining your offer. Um, but then when you get them home and they're like, oh my God, I'm gonna be healing so much faster because I'm at home, it's, it's a pretty remarkable thing. David Erickson, on the projects you noted, you had those slides about the different places where the community came together, they rebuilt the, the plaza there, that area with the credit union and things like that. I then foresee, and there are big conversations happening here in Rochester, Minnesota, and even in the Twin Cities about gentrification. What happens if a project you're working on then makes it a desirable neighborhood, and then all the developers come in, and, and, um, and then you have that problem yeah. of how affordability of housing? Yeah, no, it's a real problem, and you, you have to assume you'll be successful uh, and make adjust. You, you go into it with that mindset. So a friend of ours who um, runs uh, Purpose Built Communities, which is this group based in Atlanta, and they do sort of these whole redevelopments of public housing and turn them into mixed income. So they'll have low income people and middle income people mixed together and they'll, um, they usually build a charter school and uh, often bring in other amenities like a grocery store. And uh, what they will tell you uh, is their biggest mistake was not buying more land when it was cheap, hmm. when they were engaging in that process. So, and, and this really is a problem that Maggie Superchurch is trying to solve in Boston. Why? creating a mechanism, the equity dollars are faster. I know this is probably not a finance group, but like debt is too slow to, for real estate acquisition. Equity dollars are faster. Those are ways which you, it's like venture capital money and you can go in and pull a lot of p parcels out of the market in anticipation of rising mm. values. Uh, and so that you can create those checkerboards that allow people to stay uh, by pulling some properties out of the market, the pe let those people stay and, and, and experience the benefit of an improving neighborhood uh, and the, 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 the economic and social benefits that come from that. Um, not investing in a place is not an option, right? So I just feel like that's oftentimes, you know, there's this, there's a lot of opposition. And I'm often, I'm shocked in places where I just don't know 
you know, I go to places like Syracuse and Toledo and other places and they're all talking about gentrification. I'm like, oh my Lord, you could use some gentrification. Um, you know, there are a lot of places, 80% of the zip codes in the United States are not experiencing price pressure. You wouldn't know that from the debate, yeah. but that's what people are worried about. And just to clear, you, you're saying you could use gentrification from the economic standpoint. I mean, th there's a huge debate to be had about that. That's a very insensitive thing to say from a cultural standpoint. This is my neighborhood. I don't, you know, this is where I want to live. And I just wanted to clarify that. Well, and the point I'm trying to make is that there's using some of these tools like land banks or, or Maggie's fund and some of these others, you can make it so that the people who live there now can stay. I mean, that's, that's the point of that. Yeah. Uh, and that's so, so I'm not interested in displacing anyone. I think that's the point. Um, and I think we talk a lot about displacement and gentrification in contexts where it is probably not as serious as people think. Always get an economist here to... David, I, I just <laughs> want to second that. So it's about dignified housing. I think we all deserve dignified housing. And as part of that, there's opportunities to invest and create more affordable housing stock around the United States, giving people greater access to opportunity. Um, yeah. Stuff. So I'm going to end the session here with a little lightning round. I'm interested very briefly from each of you to, to, to reflect on something you heard one of the others speak about that you think is an idea you're going to take home in the work you are doing, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So Lena, was there something you heard someone else say that your, either your wheels are turning, either in your final weeks in Baltimore or as you transition to Planned Parenthood that you'll be focused on? Um, it's hard to go first when you're like, <laughs> Or anyone who, who, for whom that, that popped into their head. I'll go, I'll yeah. go. Um, so two things, one, one uh, again, Lena, you could tell me this is the worst idea in the world. Um, but I, all of a sudden I was like, wow, what about Planned Parenthood at home in a very advanced way, right? Like performing um, abortions at home and, and things of that, like that we would normally make people come in for. Um, that just popped into my head of something that, because we're, we're going to be starting one of our first um, post-operative home hospital pilots, taking folks from the uh, operating room straight home. Um, and it just popped into my head. And, and, and similarly, um, we, we have the desire to do a, a really add two people to our team, a handy person, handyman or handy woman, and a, um, and a community health worker. And I heard, I heard that being spoken about there. So those are probably the, mm -hmm. just the two things that just came into my head. Interesting ideas. That, uh, any other thoughts on what? Yeah, I can go next. So connecting with, uh, with David's thoughts around um, hospital um, at home, uh, what I've seen in the populations, particularly addicted populations, as we're tackling the opioid um, crisis, is that we have folks that are needing extended lengths of hospital stay because of infections that, um, that require IV antibiotics. Yeah. And the IV antibiotics cannot safely be um, given on the street, and most shelters around the United States don't allow IV antibiotics to be given. So what ends up happening if we look at the $81 million in the 500 patients that we're targeting is that they're needing to, they, they uh, inject th their drugs, they uh, get an infection from unsafe environment, they get admitted and they can't, they can't leave. So it becomes a very costly stay. And to one of your points earlier, that one hospitalization is equivalent to a year's worth of rent. Mm -hmm. So if we could deliver that IV antibiotic yeah. in the home, yeah. it would make a lot of sense. So I yeah. appreciate, appreciate that. Final minute here, thoughts from what other people talked about? I, you know, I, I, I have a PhD in, um, in uh, economic history. So, uh, I, you know, I'm, it, it's, I, I saw a guy in the airport has a t-shirt that's not that kind of doctor, you know? So like that's, <laughs> um, and uh, you know, one of the things that I, I, I'm struck by, what, what, what we know is that all markets are driven by demand. That has been true forever. And I think once there's a cash flow, um, that really starts identifying ways in which we can do upstream interventions uh, and it pay, pays, then what I've just been shocked by, every time I sit down, I listen to everyone who's talked on this panel, I say, I would hire all of them because, and if I had a cash flow, they, and they would, I think we could really expand all of the good work that they do um, in addition to others and how you coordinate that and create the, the right handoffs and things is, is the trick. But um, I, I, I'm, I've been very inspired by everybody on this stage.
Well, I'm going to learn from The Economist for, for, for a minute and say that um, for a lot of our work, so there's a saying in public health, that public health saved your life today, you just don't know it. <laughs> because there is no face of public health. By definition, it's something that we prevented from happening. So there's no face of something that didn't happen. Mm. But how can we better make the business case for that of these upstream interventions that end up making a big difference in people's lives? So we are at the end of this part of the session.